back everybody to uh, chapter six, an intro to uh, Wi-Fi wireless land after going over all the different types of um, wireless technologies and radio waves and antenna types and everything. Now let's start taking a look at the uh, different Wi-Fi lands. Um, you know, uh, as always, by the end of this, we're hoping that um, uh, you'll be able to uh, list the components uh, for wireless LAN, describe the uh, modes of operation for wireless LAN. We're going to talk about the IEEE uh, wireless LAN standards, the 802.11. Uh, uh, we're going to look at the, some radio frequencies uh, that we got to talk about with uh, communications and the making with channels and uh, frequencies and stepping on other frequencies' toes. Uh, outline power management. Uh, features and then looking at the different uh, frame formats as well. Now, wireless LANs are probably the technology that's attracted the most attention uh, since the introduction of personal computers uh, on the consumer market today. The explosive growth of wireless networks all over the world uh, was initially driven by home and small office sales. But after the ratification of the latest wireless networking standards, the 802.11n, uh, back in 2009, and uh, the AC uh, back in 2014, a lot more companies are just are deploying wireless networks to allow staff and customers to connect their own devices uh, and benefit from more flexible mobile access. Globally, public Wi-Fi hotspot access continues to grow steadily, and the Wireless Broadband Alliance predicts that mobile phone carriers will continue to deploy Wi-Fi calling to offload some of the traffic from their network. Uh, total mobile data traffic is forecast to reach uh, 30.6 exabytes per month um, this year. Uh, this, figure include, this figure will include smartphones and wireless LAN. Uh, wireless LAN technology supports a very broad range of applications, practically all laptop computers, tablets, smartphones are equipped with Wi-Fi today. Uh, coffee shops, restaurants, hotels, planes, trains, and automobiles, that'll be a great movie, um, now offer Wi-Fi internet access today. Uh, in this lesson, we're going to review the basic concepts of how Wi-Fi wireless LANs work, focusing on low-speed uh, wireless LANs, uh, up to 11 meg. Uh, this background knowledge is going to help you better understand the high-speed technologies and new standards and compatibility issues that we're going to talk about in our next lesson. Today, the widespread use of these wireless technologies means that working in this field requires a more in-depth understanding of, of how Wi-Fi works and then what you're going to have to do to be able to troubleshoot these uh, Wi-Fi lamps. So right out of the gate, we got to look at the hardware, okay? The hardware components that enable us to connect our, to these wireless uh, LANs. Um, surprisingly, there ain't a whole lot that we need, okay? In addition to a mobile device and an internet service provider, only a wireless network interface cards, wireless NIC, and an access point is needed to, for communication to actually take place. So what is a wireless NIC? Well, the hardware that allows a computer to be connected to a wired network is called a network interface card or a network adapter or a NIC. It's a device that connects the computer to the network. A wired NIC has a port for a cable connection. The cable connects to the NIC, uh, connects the NIC to the wireless network, gives you access to the media, thus establishing the link between the computer and the network. A wireless NIC performs the same functions as a wired NIC with one major exception. There is no wire coming out of the back of it. In its place, there is an antenna to send and receive the RF signals that we've been talking about for the last five uh, lessons. Specifically, when a wireless NIC uh, transmits, they modulate the data onto an RF carrier wave. They determine when to send the packet and transmit the, the packet. Wireless NICs are available in a whole bunch of different formats from from, for desktop computers. Wireless NICs are available as a card that's installed internally in an expansion slot or as an external wireless adapter that'd be connected to a USB port. 
Uh, for laptop computers, wireless NICs are available as USB devices or what we call a mini PCI card. Uh, a, a mini PCI is a small card that is as functionally equivalent to a standard PCI expansion card, uh, but significantly smaller. The antenna is usually embedded in the part of the laptop that surrounds the screen. So if we were to take the bezel off your laptop, you would see a black and a white wire that goes around your, uh, your, uh, your display, goes down through one of the hinges, and then plugs in these little itty bitty coax connectors, uh, snap onto the wireless PCI card themselves. Next is an access point. As you learned in uh, lesson one or chapter one, an AP provides wireless LAN devices with a point of access onto a wired network. An AP has three major parts, a transmitter and a receiver, also called a transceiver, okay, an antenna to radiate the signals, and an RJ45 wired network interface port that is used to connect the AP to the wired network itself. The AP also acts as the wireless communication base station for the wireless network. With few exceptions, uh, all the wireless devices that connect to the AP use the AP to transmit to other wireless devices that are connected to the same AP. The AP can also act as a bridge between the, or also acts as a bridge between the wireless and wired networks, as you can see here. The range of the access point uh, acting as the base station typically is a maximum of about 375 feet on a really good day outside. You know, if you've got walls and everything else in between, as we've been talking about, um, you're going to have scattering, diffraction, deflection, reflection, and just impedance will occur. The AP will automatically select the highest possible data rate for transmission depending on the strength and quality of the transmission that it receives from mobile devices. That's called a DRS uh, or dynamic rate selection. Because the connection speed is so dependent on the environment, testing the signal before implementation of a wireless LAN is going to be extremely important. Now, the large, largest number of devices that a single AP can, can be connected to will vary. But it's usually over 100. It used to be uh, 20 to 25 people could hit a uh, wireless access point and kind of max itself out. Uh, but with today in the Internet of Things, those numbers have increased dramatically. Um, because the wireless medium is shared among the connected devices, uh, most vendors recommend an AP max out at about 50. Um, it depends on how we're using the network. Like if we're lately using it just for email and web surfing, it's not going to be as big of an issue. But if we're doing a lot of file transfers, um, it's going to greatly reduce the number of users that can be on that network at any given time. Uh, another thing that we want to discuss discuss is the is something called a PoE or Power Over Ethernet, and it's uh, it's the most recent way in which we give access points in an typically in an enterprise environment or um, even cameras uh, power without having to put an electrical outlet beside them. Um, we uh, actually deliver electricity through the ethernet cable um, to the device that way. Uh, so instead of receiving power directly from an AC outlet, DC power is delivered to the AP through the same twisted pair ethernet cable that connects the AP to the wired network. And what it does, it really makes the uh, installation of an access point much easier. Okay. Now, we talked about uh, ad hoc. Now, the simplest, way, the simplest way to explain ad hoc is if I'm going to have my laptop wireless NIC directly connected to your laptop wireless NIC, that's ad hoc mode, okay? also known as peer-to-peer -peer mode. Okay. uses something called a standard of independent basic service set. In ad hoc mode, wireless devices communicate directly among themselves without using uh, an AP in between. 
similar to something like that. Okay. Uh, one of the problems with ad hoc mode is that wireless devices can only communicate among themselves. Uh, there's usually no process, there's no access to the wired network, so you're typically not going to be getting out to the internet unless you're, you know, you're using a different uh, method of doing that. Uh, a lot of our newer wireless uh, Windows 10 devices give you the ability to actually use your phone's access and then ad hoc and share that way. So basically sharing your internet connection would be considered an ad hoc network as well. Most smartphones today allow you to set up that uh, phone as a wireless hotspot, which permits other devices to connect to it so that they can share a cellular connection to the internet. Uh, usually have a maximum of about 10 devices, depending on the processing capacity of the device that is actually sharing the internet. Please understand you might have unlimited data on your phones, on your devices, but it doesn't mean you're going to have unlimited data on a, on, on a hotspot, okay? That's important to understand there as well. Now, when multiple APs are used, they create an area of coverage, much like the individual cells in a beehive. However, unlike in a beehive, these cells overlap to facilitate roaming. So when a mobile user uh, carrying a wireless device enters into the range of uh, more than one, one access point, his wireless device chooses the AP uh, with which to associate based on signal strength and quality. Now, once the AP accepts a connection from that device, the device changes to the radio frequency used by that particular access point. Whenever a device is not communicating on the wireless LAN, it monitors all the radio frequency to determine if a different AP can provide maybe a better quality or stronger signal. If a device finds one, perhaps uh, because the user has moved into another area of the building, it will then associate with the new AP, changing to the radio frequency of the new access point. Now, in an extended service set, we have a tradition uh, called a transition called a handoff. Now, to the user, a handoff is an ESF into an ESS is seamless because the connection between the wireless device and the wired network is never interrupted. It just gives you the ability to move from one location to the other without having to reassociate and even, in most cases, lose connection to that. This is more right here, just an example of the overlapping uh, signals have what we call infrastructure mode. Remember, this allows us to get access to the network. So if you'll notice here um, that we have our file server, we have our PC, this is our main network, okay? And we are wired, okay? We are wired to the main network, so it gives us access to mode. You'll see the overlapping here so that means if I take my laptop and I walk over to this part of the building, I will just automatically keep my connection. My, my connection will be handed off to this AP and it should be seamless when it occurs, okay? Uh, and that is the whole point of doing an extended service set. Uh, in an extended service set, sometimes we'll divide it into subnets, always set, uh, set up uh, using a dedicated VLAN that can span um, all the network switches themselves, gives us the ability to move from network to network. Um, all APs can be part of the same network segment, um, allowing users to roam freely. Uh, so you might have a, a guest network, a staff network, you know, whatever. The uh, first and early wireless LAN standards were based on the 802.11 standards. Um, they came about in 1997. They defined uh, local area networks that provide cable-free data access for devices um, that are either mobile or even in a fixed location. Uh, they started off at like one or two meg per second, which weren't great, obviously. But at that time, when we were only using networks that were maxing out at about 10 meg per second, 
one to two meg wirelessly, one to two meg of being able to pretty much be anywhere in the office, it was a pretty cool thing. Um, it was a little scary as network administrators at first because of the lack of security uh, that we had. Uh, there was some, but not a lot. Um, so it kind of like, it was a little scary at first, but you know, as always, we got through it. Now, <clears throat> the standard implemented specific transmission technologies based on differences in the PHY physical and MAC layer. Now, the IEEE 811 standard that came out in 97, um, it gave us the it uh, gave us the ability to jump out of the infrared ranges and then start using the wireless LAN frequency hopping spread spectrum and the um, and the, uh, the uh, DSS -S as well the direct sequence spread spectrum that we talked about uh, way back in chapter two. Now the standard specifies that the uh, the features of a wireless LAN, LAN uh, be transparent to the upper layers of the TCP IP protocol stack. So it's really just a layer one and layer two. Uh, no modifications are needed to any other protocols. Uh, at this at this point, uh, because uh, the, of the uh, of sticking down at layer one and layer two, uh, any network operating system or LAN application was should then run on the wireless LAN without any modification. Now, because there's of no 8 or 10 to 11 equipment has ever been introduced in the consumer market using infrared or frequency hopping spread spectrum. Uh, we, we're not even going to talk about about those technologies with this with this concept here. Instead, we're going to talk about 802 to basic 802 to 11 as it applies to the market today on what it is that you should be running into out of industry. Now, the slow maximum bandwidth of only 2 meg on the original 80211 11 standard wasn't sufficient for most of our network applications today. So as a result, the 80211 11 took another look, um, uh, took another look at the standard, uh, and it determined that they needed to be able to increase the speed. So only two years later, remember, if we said earlier that the 80211 11 came out in 97, in 99, we came out with the 11 b standard, uh, increasing the needs um, to a maximum of 11 meg per second at 2.4 gigahertz. Now, even though uh, the age 11 n amendment to the standard is still backward compatible with the original data rates of 97 of 1 and 2 meg per second, um, in the 2.4 gigahertz band, as uh, as well as with the 811 b the backward compatibility makes it possible for a lot of our older models that are running the B and G standards, they can still connect the wireless LANs um, and still actually get a little bit more speed out of them. So what I want to talk about right now is the 811 b standard. Now, B, which, came, which was ratified in 99, originally called the higher speed physical layer extension of the 2.4 gigahertz band, generally referred to as higher rate or high rate. It added two higher speeds to the 90, 1997 standard, 5.5 and 11 meg per second, and specified the, the radio frequency and direct, uh, direct sequence spread spectrum uh, as the only way to encode and modulate bit streams for transmission. 802.11b also became known as Wi-Fi uh, shortly after the establishment of the Wi-Fi alliance. Now the physical layer, okay, remember that the purpose of the PHY standard uh, is to transmit and receive signals. 
Now the answer 11B, PHY layer, was also divided into two sublayers. Um, for the physical medium, okay, we had the physical medium dependent sublayer and the physical layer convergent uh, procedure sublayer. Age 11B standard made changes only to the PHY layer of the original standard. The physical layer con convergence procedure standard for Age 11B are based on direct sequence spread spectrum. This uh, PLCP has to reformat the data received from the MAC layer when transmitting into a frame that the PMD sublayer can, can transmit. Uh, so for an example, um, you can see here that we have our, you know, our speed here to up to 11 meg per second for our data. And then all of our, this piece here comes in at one meg per second. And then we break it down and we send our data at a faster rate. The, uh, the PLCP frames made up of the three parts. We had the preamble and the data. The preamble, the preamble, the header, and the data. The preamble allows the receiving device to prepare for the rest of the frame. The header provides information about the frame itself, and then the data is the information that we're going to transmit, okay, which is obviously going to be faster. And I'm not going to cover the synchronization and all that stuff. You can see that there, and you'll also find it all in your book, okay. But I want to jump into the standards. And once the PLCP has formatted the frame, it then passes that frame to the sublayer of the PHY. Again, the job of the PMD is to translate the binary ones and zeros of the frame into RF signals. Again, the job of the PMD is to translate the binary and the RF signals, and then uh, they, so they can be transmitted transmitted via electromagnetic waves. The AOS 11B standard uses the industrial, specific, and medical, the ISM band of 2.4 gigahertz. Um, that we talked about way back in chapter three for a transmission for use in the age 11 and uh, the age 11 B standard. It specifies 14 available frequencies beginning at 2.412, incrementing then by 0 0.005 gigahertz uh, for the five gigahertz per channel, uh, five megahertz per channel, except for channel 14. It should be right here, so you can see. Those are the 14 channels that we have for the 2.4 gigahertz range for the AF2.11b. Now, bear in mind that these frequencies and their associated limitations may change over time and will as a result of the work by the, the uh, ITU-T, which with the governments in various countries. Now, by employing dynamic rate selection, the PMD on um, an AP adjusts the transmission rate automatically from 1 to 2 to 5.5 or 11 meg per second, and then down again depending on the latest signal strength that it's receiving. Remember, it's dynamic at this point. Okay. You also may remember that DSSS uses an expanded uh, redundant code called the Barker code to transmit each data bit. The Barker code is used when AJ11B is transmitting at one or two meg per second. However, to transmit at rates above two meg per second, we have to use something called complementary code keying. Um, um, as a set of the code words, okay, um, so what happens is a table containing a 64, 64 8 bit code words is used instead as a set of these code words have unique mathematically calculated properties that allow them to be correctly distinguished from one another by the receiver. The 5.5 meg rate uses four of these code words to encode four bits per signal, whereas the 11 meg rate uses all 64 code words to encode eight uh, bits per symbol that are coming through.
Then we have, last before we jump into this one here, I want to discuss the medium access control layer. The H11B data link layer consists of two uh, sub-layers, logical link control and the media access control. H11B standard specifies no changes in the LLC, uh, so the LLC remains the same as it would for 802.3 wired connect network, which means it's really just connecting our data link layer up to the logical link layer, which is the network layer. So think of it as it's a bridge away for the data link layer, which is all but physical, to then be able to communicate to the logical layer, layer three, the network layer. Um, and that hasn't changed uh, for wired or wireless. Therefore, all the changes required for H11B wireless LANs uh, to work are confined to all down to the 802.1, the max sub layer itself. So, how do we share the communications? If we only have so much bandwidth and we have X amount of devices and users trying to communicate on the, on the wireless LAN, how are we going to, you know, divvy all of this up so that everybody gets their own fair uh, time slots? You know what I mean? So, now because because all devices in the wireless LAN have to share their, the radio frequency, have to share the airwaves, uh, so what we're saying is share the medium, okay? Um, we, we're going to have devices that are like running into each other, okay? They'll have a collision. The data becomes corrupted if we have a collision. It cannot be correctly decoded by the receivers if we have a collision. So, like in this example here, you know, it's a, a collision on the network of a um, of a wired network, right? And in the wired networks, we use carrier sent multiple access with collision detection. Uh, so, how do we do this with a with a, a wireless network? Um, if you're not running, if you don't uh, receive an acknowledgement, or if you don't know that there's a uh, a collision that has occurred, well, we're going to use something out there called carrier sense multiple access with collision avoidance, okay? Collision detection, what we use on wired networks, was designed to handle a collision. Our job on wireless is to avoid the collision altogether. And so what happens is you're associated with a an access point. And when you want to communicate on a wire network, you're, you're connected to a switch. And so you're always listening to the carriers. Same thing what's going on, you're listening for silence. And when silence occurs, you transmit your data. The problem is other devices out there will transmit their data at the same time. You'll have a collision. A collision will be detected. And then we'll send out what's called a back off algorithm. And then telling everybody when is their opportunity, when is their time slot that they can now speak. Well, in carrier sense, multiple access with collision avoidance, what we're going to do differently is rather than listening for silence, okay, we are then going to say, hey, Mr. Access Point, I would like to make a request to send information. And then Mr. Access Point is going to talk back to us and say, here is your clear to send. Okay. Here is your opportunity to now communicate. Okay. That would be your request to send and your clear to send. So transmitting device, send a request to send uh, to the AP. The AP alerts all the other devices that it is now going to give a time slot to this node and respond back with a clear to send, tell the other de devices that you can't talk right now if someone else is talking. And then the, that device will now have the ability to then communicate on the, uh, the request to send 
uh, and clear to send protocol impose additional overhead as well, which reduces network performance. And it, it's not used unless there's a lot of collisions. Now, the second method for reducing collisions is something called fragmentation. Now, fragmentation involves dividing the data to be transmitted from one large frame into several smaller ones. Uh, sending many smaller frames instead of one large frame reduces the amount of time that the wireless medium is being used to transmit each individual frame. So in fragmentation, if the length of data of a data frame uh, to be transmitted exceeds exceed a configurable value, the, the MAC layer will divide or fragment that frame into several smaller frames. And then each fragmented frame is given a fragment number. The first fragmented frame is zero, the next will be one, and so on and so on. Okay. After the frame is received and verified to be free of errors, the receiving device sends back an acknowledgement and that it's ready to receive the next fragment. Um, after all the fragments are received at the destination, they are then reassembled by their sequence numbers or fragment numbers back into the original frame uh, by the MAC uh, layer. It's an alternative, fragmentation really, it's an alternative to the request to send, clear to send. However, it doesn't create additional overhead. Uh, it does create additional overhead in two ways. First, more frames imply the additional MAC and PLCP headers. Second, the receiving device must send a separate acknowledgement for each small uh, fragment received. Fragmentation does not always have to be used separately from the RTS-CTS. In a busy wireless LAN, they may have to be combined uh, to reduce uh, the amount of collisions that are occurring. Now, the standard allows both methods to be used uh, simultaneously. Now, another type of channel access would be polling. Now, with this method, each device is sequentially asked if the AP, uh, if it has anything to transmit. Uh, after associating with the AP, devices cannot transmit unless they are polled. Now, if the device has something to transmit, it will send a positive response to the AP. Um, the AP will then grant the device permission to transmit. And if the device not, does not have anything to transmit, it will send a null data frame to the AP, kind of like a, like a, a blank token. And then the device, next device sequence will be pulled, kind of like um, like a token ring. Now, uh, it, it's, a, it's a very orderly way of allowing a device to transmit a frame. Each device is given a turn similar to uh, similar to token ring. Polling effectively eliminates collisions because every device must wait its turn and receive permission from the AP before it can actually send or transmit anything. This optional polling method is known as a point coordination function, or PCF. Uh, with PCF, the AP serves as a polling device, and when using PCF, the, the AP or the point coordinator will listen for wireless for the wireless traffic. It's because in order to allow their device to associate with the AP, we have you know it's got to be listening and then join the wireless LAN. Uh, PCF must still allow some time slots for con uh, when contention uh, for contention access, um, in which case the wireless LAN uses the DCF. Uh, if the AP hears no uh, traffic on the wireless medium, it'll send out a beacon frame to all devices. Uh, one field of the frame consists of uh, a value that indicates the number of time slots that will be used for the polling, as well as the number of time slots it will be used for contention. Devices that are not yet associated with the AP, but that receive the beacon, will take advantage of the contention frame period to contact the AP and then join the wireless plan when they, when they have the option. Before a device can communicate in a wireless LAN, it must first join that network. Now, the MAC layer of H8711 standard provides functionality for a device to join a wireless LAN. That process for joining the wireless LAN is what we call association. So, in the case of an extended service set, devices also have to connect to different APs 
when a user is roaming from device from AP to AP. It means that device must connect to another AP in the extended service set and then must disconnect from an AP that they were previously connected to. And that is called reassociation. Uh, regardless of which mode is being used, the device must first associate with the wireless LAN. Association begins with the device scanning the wireless medium to discover an AP uh, or an ad hoc device that might be in its range. If you've ever noticed, sometimes you might see a, uh, a wireless printer. Um, like when you're looking for a wireless network and you see a printer, uh, a standalone printer, that'd be an ad hoc association. Now there are two types of scanning, passive and active. Passive scanning involves a device listening to each of the channels for a separated time, usually 10 seconds. The device listens for beacon frames uh, transmitted by the APs or by other devices in an, um, in an ad hoc network within range. The information contained within the beacon frame includes how often beacon frames are sent and supported uh, the support transmission rates of the network, and then the APs, the SSID, and the BSSID. The transmission of the SSID can then be disabled on an AP to attempt to hide the network from scanning devices. The hiding of an SSID, we're going to talk about uh, later on when we cover like, wireless LAN security. The second type of scanning is called active scanning. It involves the device first sending out a special frame called a probe frame uh, on each available channel. It then waits for an answer called a probe response frame from the AP to which um, to which it sent the frame. Uh, like the beacon frame, the probe response frame contains information the device needs to begin a dialogue with the AP. Now, according to the 802.11 standard, the probe's response frame must always be sent back and must also include the SSID, regardless of whether the AP is configured to transmit, uh, transmit it by default in the beacon or not. Now, devices do not normally perform active scans on a wireless medium, but every device is capable of sending probe frames. Some wireless LAN apps, such as those used for war driving, include this feature. Um, remember back to CNT 120, war driving is the practice of uh, discovering and recording information about wire plans in the neighborhood or around the city while driving or walking. In the early days of Wi Fi, when wireless plans were not as common, war drivers even used chalk on outside of walls or sidewalks to mark the existence of a wireless LAN that was called war chalking. Uh, after a device has received the network information in the beacon, they can then begin to, to negotiate a wireless LAN connection. Uh, to join, <coughs> to join the wireless LAN, the device will send an associate request frame to the AP. That includes the device's own capabilities and support transmission rate. The AP, <coughs> the AP will then return what's called an associate um, response frame containing a status code. Uh, and a device ID number that will be used as long as it remains connected to the same AP. The device can be pre-configured to connect to a specific wireless LAN. In this case, the device is already configured with the SSID on the LAN, on a wireless LAN. Likewise, some APs can be configured to accept or reject a connection from certain devices as well. A reassociation would be when we have a, um, when the device determines that the link to its current AP is poor, okay, because it's been scanning the medium and maintaining information related to various APs uh, in the extended service set, it'll then switch to the frequency of the AP with the next strongest signal, and then it sends a reassociate request frame. Um, if the new AP accepts the reassociation request, it'll then send a reassociation response frame. The device and the new AP will then send a disassociation frame to the previous one so it can cut off that particular link. So then, in which case, uh, when I go from one AP to another, so when I connect to the new AP, I reassociate. Okay, I'm associating 
but it's a reassociation because it's the same SSID name. Then I got to tell the old one, hey, look, I'm not going to stay connected to you anymore. I'm going to disassociate you so now you don't have to keep trying to give me bandwidth. The next thing we want to look at is power management. Now, most devices in the wireless land are laptop computers, smartphones, tablets, um, giving the users access to freedom to roam without being tethered to networks by wire. Now, when these devices are mobile, and consequently not powered to a power out, they depend on batteries for their primary power source. To conserve battery power, wireless NICs can go into what's called sleep mode. So when a device is participating in wireless LAN, it must remain fully powered up to receive network transmission. Missing transmissions, because the NIC is in sleep mode, may cause an application running on the device to drop a connection or in a TCP session. Now, the answer to the issue of battery-powered devices being able to shut down its radio to save energy um, is known as power management. In the 811 standard, power management allows the mobile device's NIC to turn off its radios as often as possible to conserve battery, but still not miss out on data transmission. Now, power management in AH11 is transparent to all protocols and applications so that it does not interfere with network, normal network function. Now, note that in AH11, the power management function can only be used when devices connected in infrastructure mode. The key to power management is synchronization. Every device on a wireless LAN has its own local timer. And at regular intervals, the AP sends out a beacon signal that contains a timestamp. Now, devices will turn on their radios during every beacon transmission to receive these frames from an AP and then synchronize their local timers so with that of the AP. When a wireless device goes into sleep mode by turning off its wireless uh, radios, it first informs the AP of the change in its status. The AP re uh, keeps a record of these devices that are awake and of those that are sleeping. So when the AP receives frames in the network destined uh, for devices that have radios off, it will temporarily store the frames that are destined to the device that are in sleep mode. And this is called buffering. Okay. Now since the AP has a uh, only a limited capacity to buffer frames in the next beacon, it will be at a traffic indication map contain the IDs of devices uh, for which it has buffered frames. Now all the devices that have been sleeping must awaken by turning on the wireless radio and go into active listening mode during beacon transmission. So a device learns that it has buffered frames waiting at the AP, it'll send a request to the AP then for those frames. And if the TIM, or the traffic indication map, does not include the device ID of a particular uh, device, uh, signaling that it has no buffered frames, the device can then return to sleep mode. And that's an example, as you can see right here, one that's going to stay in sleep or one that has to get information. Now, to understand many of the intricacies of how CSMA-CA works, how backward compatibility with leg legacy devices handled by the latest amendments of the standard, um, as well as some of the challenges to troubleshooting wireless fans, it's important to understand the MAC frame format. Now, the 811B standard specifies three types of MAC frame. The first type of MAC frame is known as the management frame. Now, these frames are used to set up the initial communication between the device and the, uh, and the AP. The association request, the reassociation request, response frame, and the disassociation frames are all examples of management frames. Now, the format of the management frame, as you can see here, okay, the frame uh, control field indicates the current version number of the standard and whether encryption is being used. The duration field contains the number of microseconds needed to transmit. This value is going to differ depending on whether the PCF or DCF modes are being used. The sequence control field is the sequence number 
for the frame and if necessary the fragment number. The control frames are the second type of Mac frame. Now after association and authentication between the devices and the APs are established, the control frames provide assistance in delivering the frames that contain the data. The request to send and acknowledge frames are examples of control frames. Data frames are the third type of MAC frame. They carry the information to be transmitted to the destination device. The format of data frame okay, is shown here, and the fields, okay, address 1 through address 4, contain contain the destination MAC address. The source MAC address and the transmitter MAC address and the receiver MAC address, depending on how the network is configured. The number of address fields will vary depending on the type of MAC frame that is transmitted. Now to understand the message exchange process in a wireless LAN, you need to understand the collision avoidance mechanism in DCF that APs and wireless devices use to communicate. So for CSMA CA to work properly in DCF contention, the 802.11 standard defines a number of interframe spaces or time gaps between the frames in a wireless LAN. Now these are designed to handle the contention for the medium among several devices that are attempting to communicate. So to keep this explanation as simple as possible, we'll only review the procedure and rules associated with using DCF. We're not going to look at the procedure or rules associated with RPS, CCS, or PCF. So in 802.11, interframe spaces perform critical functions. First, we want to talk about the short interframe space. It's a time period used to allow all transmitted signals to arrive and be decoded at the receiving device, including multipath signals that take a longer trajectory um, and arrive later at the receiver. The short interframe spaces occur immediately after the transmission of each frame, regardless of what type it, it might be. No devices are allowed to transmit during the SIFS or the short interframe space. If a frame has been transmitted to one specific de uh, device and provided there were no errors, the receiving device will send an acknowledgement immediately after the after the SIP frame. Now the DCF interface frame space interface frame, okay, um, interframe space, sorry, is a time period during which all devices must wait between transmissions of data frames. The, the diffs occur after the transmission of an acknowledgement or right after the SIFS if the frame transmitted for the broadcast where there will be no acknowledgement on a broadcast. Uh, a device when you to transmit will listen to the medium during the diffs. If it does not hear any transmission during the DIFS or the DIFS, it will be allowed to transmit a frame. Otherwise, it will defer the transmission. The times of the space intervals are measured in microseconds. So 10 for SIFS and 50 microseconds for DIFS. The basic rules of communication um, in an ASL11 network are, are shown here. Okay. A device that wants to transmit begins listening for an RF signal on the medium, which indicates the presence of frame traffic on the network during uh, the disk. If no RF signal is detected at the end of the disk and the device back the device's back off interval has counted down to zero, it can then begin transmitting its frame. The size of a frame 
includes both the length of time necessary to send the data and the sys time. And every device that receives this information will not transmit for the duration of or a frame transmission by another device, assuming that it heard and understood the last transmission. Remember, no one transmits during the SIP. When a transmission is over, the sending device begins listening for an acknowledgement from the receiving device. The receiving device must then send an acknowledgement immediately after the SIP, after receiving an acknowledgement. The transmitting device begins to wait for a random number of time slots. Um, it's back off interval. Now, if the transmitting device does not receive uh, an acknowledgement after the SIFs, uh, it is allowed to then maintain control of the meeting and then begin retransmitting the frame that was not acknowledged immediately after the diff time. It will then try to do this a few times uh, and then indicate an error uh, if, if it doesn't get an acknowledgement back. If the frame was acknowledged correctly, the transmitting device listens to the medium and then counts down while waiting its random back off interval, except during the SIFs or DIFs or during the transmission by another device. Once the back off interval ends, the device checks for traffic at the end of the next disk, and then the process repeats itself from the first point. Here, device A has got a frame to transmit. It's Back off counter, period counter, is zero. It senses the carrier during the diffs, okay, and then finds no traffic on the medium. At the end of the diffs, it begins transmitting the frame. Device B, right, had two time slots left to count down, but it can only do so during the contention access period. After device A finishes the transmission of its frame, it sends its random back off count, it sets its random back off counter back to three. The network enters a contention access period, and both A, device A and B begin counting down their back off time slots. After two time slots, back the devices, device B's back off counter reaches zero, and it has something to transmit. Device B finds the medium free during the disk, and then transmits immediately thereafter. Like device B before, device A does nothing except count, uh, count down after it diffs and then when the medium is free, once device B has received acknowledgement um, for its most recent transmission, the process uh, that we just did will start over again. Now the process that we just talked about is what actually occurs in a 2.11 wireless LAN, and it is it is the essence of the DCF collision avoidance method. However, collisions will still happen. One of the most common causes is what is called the hidden node problem. So, when two or more devices are able to communicate with the AP, but maybe too far away, or blocked by an obstacle and cannot hear each other, this is when the RTS CTS solves the problem. <clears throat> when an APC sends out a CTS frame, all devices are able to receive it. The CTS frame includes the amount of time required for a particular device to transmit its frame. So all other devices will refrain from transmitting during that time until they hear an acknowledgement frame come back from, uh, from, the, from that hidden node. Well, that concludes this uh, this chapter uh, for today. Um, there'll be uh, some associated uh, lab work to go with this, uh, and then uh, come on back, and we'll uh, we'll be covering chapter seven, which I believe is enhancing your wireless LAN performance, followed then by expanding our wireless LANs and wireless security, and so on.